Hey, BC here. Welcome to BC Nephro. Thanks for watching. Today, I'm going to talk about hypernatremia. For a complete electrolyte series, you can check out the playlist on this channel and the list of articles at bcnephro.com. Links to both will be in the description below. But today, it's hypernatremia. So, I'm going to be talking about some things to think about when you're diagnosing the cause of the hypernatremia and some th things to think about when you're, you're treating the hypernatremia. We'll get right into it. Hypernatremia means dehydration, not enough water. If there's not enough water, there's a couple possible reasons for this. One is not enough water in, and the other is too much water out. And if there's too much water out, as a nephrologist, think about is there renal losses of water or extra renal losses of water. So this is the approach. First thing, look at the urine output and the specific gravity on the urinalysis. If the urine output is low, and the urine specific gravity is high, 1030 or higher, this means the urine is concentrated and the kidneys are retaining water, which is an appropriate response to a water deficit or hypernatremia or dehydration. So this likely means too little water in or extra renal losses. Now, renal losses of water are going to be associated with polyuria. So look at the urine output. If there's polyuria, which is defined as more than three liters of water a day in 24 hours, if that's the case, your differential here is diabetes insipidus or an osmotic diuresis. So the next step here is you look at the urine osmolality. If there's diabetes insipidus, that means the kidneys lack the ability to concentrate either because the body is not producing ADH, central diabetes insipidus, or the kidneys are resistant to ADH. That's nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And the nephrogenic diabetes insipidus would be the most common cause, which is seen in patients who have a history of lithium exposure. Uh, this is how lithium affects the kidneys. If that's the case, the kidneys can't concentrate. There's a water diuresis, so the urine osmolality is going to be low, typically less than 150. So if there's polyuria, urine osmolality less than 150, and hypernatremia, you're thinking about diabetes insipidus, and then you can get into the um, differentiation between central or nephrogenic. Now, if there's polyuria and the urine osmolality is high, greater than 300, you're thinking about a solute diuresis. There's a certain amount of solute production by the body uh, per day, and the kidneys need to excrete that. So typically the amount of osms that the kidneys need to excrete in a day is somewhere in between 600 and 900. And osms essentially are, are salt and protein metabolites. In some cases, if there's a catabolic state, increased osm osmolar load, the kidneys need to excrete that. And when the kidneys excrete that, it drags water with it. So if the urine osmolality is greater than 300, let's say it's 400, and there is greater than three liters of urine a day, let's say there's four liters. So 400 times four liters is 1600 osms. That means there's more osm production and is often seen in uh, critically ill patients with a catabolic state. They have this catabolic state, so they have this breakdown. They might be on steroids, they might be on TPN, and this is where that is uh, seen. Next, getting into treatment. Uh, so the, obviously the treatment of not enough water, dehydration, is to give water. So the water can be given orally, enterally, via feeding tube or IV with either D5W or other hypotonic fluids such as half normal saline. So just to explain this, in half normal saline, it's like you're giving two sets of fluids, half saline, half water. So if you're giving half normal saline at 100 cc's an hour, it's the same thing as giving saline at 50 an hour and water at 50 an hour. You're giving, uh, that's how much water you're replacing. So you can calculate the free water deficit and um, replete that, that uh, free water. Um, uh, things to know. First, how quickly can we uh, correct hypernatremia? Now, we know in hyponatremia, a chronic hyponatremia, you don't want to correct too quickly because you can cause complications, specifically central pontine myelinosis, and you don't want to uh, correct by more than six to eight uh, within the first 24 hours. Now, with hypernatremia, at least in adults, you have some more flexibility. Now, don't apply this to pediatrics. I do not know about pediatrics. Check with someone else. But at least for adults, you're a little bit safer. Now, it has been said you can, you can correct by half a, a milliequivalent per hour. So that would be 12 and 24 hours safely with, with hypernatremia. And you could probably even correct faster 
than that. So there was an article that studied this. A link to that article will be in the description below. They did not find increased uh, complications with uh, a fast rate of correction of hypernatremia. So another pitfall. In some cases, the patient is hypervolemic and also has hypernatremia. So you're given water and you're, wor and you're worried that, well, the patient's hypervolemic, you're given water. So one thing uh, to remember here is you still need to give water. The water is going, at least the majority of the water is going intracellary. So if it goes inside cells, it's not in the intravascular space, it's not in the interstitium, it's not causing pulmonary edema. So you can give water. If the patient's volume overloaded and you also need to diurese, then diurese. So they say if you give a loop diuretic, the concentration of the urine is equivalent to about half normal saline. So if you're peeing out half normal saline, half of that is free water, and you're giving uh, D5W at the same rate, you're going to have a net negative sodium balance, you're going to help the pulmonary edema, and you're going to get, you're going to have a net positive water balance and, and help the hypernatremia. Another thing, a lot of times the uh, free water deficit is calculated, free water is given, but the sodium doesn't get better. And there's a lot of questions why nephrology consults. So there's a couple possible reasons. The, the main reason is that you're not giving enough water. So why are you not giving enough water? Two possibilities. One is you're not giving enough water as you think you are, and that usually has to do with potassium. So potassium counts to the tonicity and the serum sodium concentration because when you give potassium, it goes into cells. Most of potassium is intracellary, and then sodium comes out of cells. So let's say you're giving half normal saline with 40 milligrams of potassium at a rate of 100 an hour. You think you're giving half normal saline and 50 cc's of free water an hour, but you're really giving the equivalent of three quarters normal saline, and you're only giving 25 cc's an hour of free water. So this is a cause of you're not giving as much water as you think, and the patient is um, staying hypernatremic. The other cause is that you're not account, accounting for ongoing free water losses. Now these ongoing free water losses can be insensible losses with a ventilator, with fever. It can be GI losses, um, but it also can be renal losses. And what happens is, what can happen is this, the patient comes in with dehydrated, with hypernatremia, and also has pre-renal acute kidney injury with a very high BUN. So when you repeat the volume, the BUN starts coming down, it starts getting peed out in the urine, causing a secondary osmotic diuresis. So in order to calculate for how much free water losses are going on in the urine, which you would need to account for in addition to calculating the deficit, you can do something called the electrolyte free water clearance, and I'll put this formula in the description below as well. So that's it, some things to think about when you're diagnosing hypernatremia and when you're treating hypernatremia. If you made it this far, thanks for watching. Hit like, subscribe, let your friends know about this if you found it helpful, and until next time.